This is Jay Washburn. And I'm Joe Bendosky. And you're listening to Start Writing. So. And uh, this week, we are doing our first full-on marketing discussion. This is exciting. <laughs> you're excited? <laughs> so this is not replacing craft discussions. We'll still be doing those. Um, but what happened is I listened for a long time. I was listening to a lot of podcasts where they were interviewing different writers and talking about marketing. And this essentially became the shiny ball for me. I would chase these different things and different things that they would say. And the problem was I wasn't getting enough context to really make it relevant to make a decision as to whether or not this was something I wanted to do or not. And I found that it was only in picking up books on these specific marketing tactics that I really had enough information to go out and do it and had enough understanding to decide if I wanted to do it. And so based on that, I decided it would be good if we did a full discussion on marketing each month so that we could be more in depth, we could give you bigger context. And so instead of saying, this person's making a ton of sales using this technique, I'm going to go try it and then you fail at it, (laughs) we, we can say... This is a technique being used. These are the genres they're writing in. This is what they've done in the past that makes that tool work for them. We can give you bigger context. We can give you closer, tighter examples about how it's working. So I think it'll be more useful than the marketing minutes. So those are going to go away. And we're just going to do once a month a full discussion on marketing itself. Uh, And so that that that's kind of where this is coming from. Is, is my thought that, uh, it would just, it would just be more helpful to have it all in a chunk instead of those tidbits because I myself, you know, was, was getting frustrated with the tidbits I was getting from the mm-hmm. interviews I was listening to. Man, and this topic is just huge. And I feel like exactly what you described that just about everybody's heard all these crazy strategies and it's hard to know which ones to focus on, uh, and what might fit your personality and your book. Yeah. So so. this is awesome. All right. So this week in critiques, uh, I was editing a manuscript and I noticed the writer doing a lot of what I would just call comma acrobats, acrobatics, (laughs) right? And so what they would do is um, they would have like the first sentence of several sentences in a row, start with he, she, you know, just the subject over and over again. And so to avoid this, they would then take a comma and take the beginning of the sentence and move it to the middle, and the middle of the sentence to the beginning. Instead of saying, she was running down the hallway, they would say, running down the hallway, she saw, you know. And so it was this acrobatics where they were taking the subject, moving to the, to the middle of the sentence, just so they wouldn't have all of their sentence beginning with she. The problem with this is you're writing in an active voice style, but you're using a comma to make it look like a passive voice. And it's just confusing, right? You lose clarity in it because now it's just, it's not in the order our brain tries to think of information. You've restructured it with this comma in these acrobatics here. So I would just say that they, they're probably going for sentence variety, which is a really good thing. But there are other ways to do that. Right. And like length of sentence, for example, um, changing the subject. Uh, yeah, one of the things I try to do if I feel like I've focused on a single subject too long or this is a case of written as opposed to audio, but every once in a while I'll read a manuscript and the beginning of every paragraph is the character's name. <laughs> <laughs> and in text, it looks weird. In audio, it doesn't matter. Nobody sees it and mm-hmm. you don't have that. That looks off. So one of the techniques I do is not wanting to do my comma acrobatics. Instead... I'll begin a paragraph with a descriptive sentence that isn't about the subject. It's about the setting. So I weave in a piece of setting just to avoid that visual hiccup that can happen there. Man, writing is complicated, (laughs) right? Like, not only do you have to have these gripping plots, you have to have these active verbs, but you've also got to think about what does it look like on the page? (laughs) Man, another thing, you mentioned, like, the visual aspect. I think the audio aspect is important too so read it out loud and you'll be able to detect when these comma acrobatics are awkward you'll hear it if you read it aloud so okay um and i've talked about this a lot but i saw again this week one actor per paragraph and its Mm -hmm. sister which i've been thinking of its name for a while i call it change of paragraph change of character and so what this is is i've seen this fairly often is 
uh, a writer will be writing a paragraph and let's say they adhere to one actor per paragraph and this paragraph belongs to John. So we get some thoughts from John, we get some action from John and then the paragraph ends, we start a new paragraph and it's dialogue and then when we get to the tag we see that dialogue belonged to John. So here's the problem. When we're dealing with one actor per paragraph, when you change paragraphs, I assume you've now changed characters, particularly when you're dealing with dialogue. Because mm-hmm. it's like, why would you have yeah, made a paragraph? I would say always. Always with dialogue. with dialogue. You change paragraphs, you change speakers in dialogue. And so if you have this actor's paragraph and then you put the dialogue in a separate paragraph, Unless that dialogue begins with the character's name, like an action beat, and then flows into the dialogue, I'm going to think it belongs to a different character. And so don't do that. <laughs> it's as simple yeah. as that, right? So one actor per paragraph and change of paragraph means change of character. So don't pull that dialogue out from their action paragraph. If John has an action paragraph, put the dialogue at the end of that paragraph. So I just got to... You you taught me this rule a couple of years ago. Yeah. And to be honest, when I first heard it, I was like, nah, not necessarily. Like, I, I kind of had some resistance to it. But I just... So, my full-time job is actually in the user experience mm-hmm. industry. So, like, I'm creating software and trying to make it easy to use. Right. And this is a usability feature <laughs> of your book. Like, if you follow this rule, it's just going to be so much easier for your reader. Yeah. And you want that. Yeah. Yeah. I- I, I've had people point out that when I talk about writing craft, they say, you think about how the reader looks at it so much. I was like, I do, because I read a lot. And if I trip for a moment in a book over a line, over a paragraph, I immediately say, why did I trip? What happened here? Why is this not clear? And why is this confusing? So, you know, like when I talk about uh, uh, post-dialogue description as the worst thing, You know, I always point out there are best-selling writers who do it. There are classics that are written that way. People write that way because it's done. But the problem is it doesn't think about how does the reader read that? Mm -hmm. Because if you describe how a dialogue should be read after it's been read, you are wasting your words. (laughs) (laughs) And you're messing with your audiobook narrator's mind. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You're making it hard on that audiobook narrator too. So, okay. Um, Oh, and another thing I saw this week was... uh, Cause, then effect. Now, I was seeing this a lot done with comma acrobatics. So people would say, like, you know, his knee crunched down, or there was a loud crack as she kicked him in the knee. Well, if you say there was a loud crack as she kicked him in the knee, you've told me the effect and then given me the cause, and that's not how the human brain thinks. We want cause, then effect. (laughs) And without that, we stumble. It's confusing. Be like, why was there a loud crack? Where'd that come from? Why is that there? Be like, she kicked him in the knee. Be like, but didn't she kick him in the knee before the loud crack? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't that have happened first? So yeah. And like I said, a lot of times when this happens, people are doing their comma acrobatics, but whenever you're looking at events, cause then effect. Always, always. (laughs) It sounds basic, but a lot of writers, you know, will will jump the gun on that. Well, so, yeah, I'm like, I'm processing this. <laughs> so, really, the kicking, I guess the kicking began first. Mm-hmm. But really, these are two simultaneous, somewhat. No, uh, but the kick is what causes the sound. When we break it down to the milliseconds, the kick the comes kick first. Is, is the yeah. cause of the sound. You know, it mm-hmm. is its impact. So when in doubt, break it down to the millisecond. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Travis has some stuff for us here. Yeah. uh, I've been on a Michael Crichton kick. I've been rereading all his books. (laughs) Um, And I just read Sphere and I noticed something really cool that he did. So uh, Norman is the main character and you... Like in the beginning of the book, he gets this essentially call to arms and he's got to travel from like California or something on a bunch of uh, sequential flights down to Fiji. And then when he arrives, he and the rest of the team get briefed on what's going to happen. They're going to go down under the water, right? Uh, When he gets there, though, he starts dozing off during the briefing. And so he misses basically everything that he was supposed to know before he goes down there. And this was super cool because it then allows him as the lead character to keep asking questions as he proceeds. So you can like slow. So 
The exposition for the character should have happened all at once, but it doesn't. It happens over time, and that just was like a really cool effect, like a cool tool for the narrator to use for us readers, like we slowly get to it. But I think it's important to notice that there was a good reason for Norman to fall asleep. Like, you would be tired after 24 hours of travel. And so it made sense for the character to do that, but then it was also a great tool for the writer. Anyway, I, I noticed that and I was like, cool, this is sweet. This is genius. I that is, that <laughs> is genius. Like, like when you told me about it, I was like, that is, that is brilliant writing. Like he had this huge chunk of exposition. And I imagine his editor said, Michael, you got to change that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so by having Norman fall asleep and giving a just cause for him to fall asleep, Suddenly, that exposition is staggered throughout wow. as it becomes relevant to each event. So now you're not even really, you don't even really have to have a good memory of the info dump. You get it like immediately before because Norman's suddenly confused again. Be like, great, wait, what's going on? Yeah. And so you get it as you need it. And it's also cool because he can then ask different characters different things. So there's a variety in the exposition too. Cause yeah. it's like, so and so explains this, someone else explains this, someone else that. Yeah. It's really well. That is yeah. brilliant. I'm going to have to check out that book just for that reason. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cool. So, okay. So discussion this week. Um, I'm going to mention this up front. So here, we're, the, 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 what we're going to be talking about today is deciding on your marketing path. Now, all of the elements we talk in here, probably each of them is going to be its own full discussion in greater detail. But today we want to talk about the path that you're going to choose to really focus on and talk about the differences between the two paths and the information you're going to want to look at to pick the one you're going to follow. So in the two major paths we're looking at are email list building versus ads. Now, you're going to need to do both eventually. But mm -hmm. we're, what we're talking about here is the big focus, right? So if you talk to ad-focused writers, they will say, you're going to be looking at those ads at least once a week. Ideally, once a day, you're going to be tweaking and adjusting and improving them. If you talk to an email list builder, they will say, set it and forget it, right? Mm. You, you set it once, check it maybe once a month, kill the ones that aren't getting good ROI, keep the ones that are, right? Mm. And so... Well, you're saying forget the email list, so you're not looking at your list? No, 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 no. Set it and forget it, the ads. So an okay, email list okay. builder will say set it and forget it on your ads. Mm -hmm. Once you get them working, you don't worry about them ever again. Hmm. So because their focus is building an email list, they just do ads on the side, right? So we want to look at these are the two different paths. And the big piece of information that is going to decide which path you follow is how fast do you write a book? Hmm. And the reason for that is, is if you're an email list builder, let's say you've got 40,000 people on your email list, right? So when you release a book, you can get a ton of sales from that. You know, thousands of people are going to be buying a book when you release. But let's say you're also paying, you know, $600 a month to maintain that list to your provider and you release a book once a year. Is the cost of maintaining that list going to be offset by that once a month, once a year release, mm. right? Because I've encountered writers who had 15,000 people on their email list, but they were only producing a book a year, maybe even less. And they're saying, I'm losing money. I'm selling thousands of books and losing money Wow! because they weren't writing fast enough to be pursuing that path. Wait, so what was costing so much? Maintaining the email list, Right. So just the overhead for just the overhead like, for the mail email chip list or whatever. Yeah. Mm. So um so and then conversely, so you know, the recommendation we made to this author was stop trying to be an email author. Mm. And you don't write that fast. You're an ads author. And this so an ads author, if you're writing one book a year, that's fine because you're trying to generate your revenue through your ads. And so you're going to be spending, you know, more time looking at your ads, adjusting and tweaking them, but you're not paying an overhead for a big list, right? So an ads author, the purpose of their email list is beta readers and early reviews. That's why an ads author is going to have a list. And it doesn't need to be a big one, you know. If they're if they're hyperactive, a hundred is plenty for an ads-focused author. They're like, I release a book once a month, I mean once a year, and, you know, my, my people love it. You know, I've got you know, 20 baby readers, and then I can pick up 60 reviews on launch day hmm. from my people, right? And my list is only 100, not a big deal, right? Whereas 
let's say you're releasing a book a month and you've got 40,000 people on that email list and let's say 20,000 of them buy it, you're making a killing. You are making a killing off of that email list. And even if the over hundred, overhead is 600 a month, doesn't matter because you're making far more. It is worth it to make that big list. So, so you'll hear authors say, build the list, build the list, build the list. I'm saying the list depends on how fast you're writing books. If you're not writing books fast enough to cover the upkeep of a big list, a big list isn't for you. So my thought, I, I have never dealt with the problem of having such a big list that it, there's a high overhead to maintain it. I wonder if, because I feel like you just wouldn't want to shut down that power if you if you really had a large list. But I wonder if if the monthly overhead really is a burden. I wonder if you could export the list and cancel your account, and just, or, or or like kind of essentially hibernate it so that you're not paying that monthly, but like okay. keep all those. Well, I, I don't know. So. Part of the, the email list model is regular contact with your readers so you don't just show up mm-hmm. and say, I'm selling you this. Yeah. Now, if you just are showing up day of, uh, my book is out, mm-hmm. you can do that through Goodreads, right? Like that's what I have set up with Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson releases a book, Goodreads lets me know. Mm-hmm. So if that's what you want, then you're not following this model at all. But what there's, but, the feedback and the studies and the experience of the authors is saying, if I don't have regular contact, people forget I'm even an author they're trying to follow. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. Wow. So, so that's the email list model, right? Now, the ads model, as we said, is you're going to be writing copy. You're going to be doing split tests on your copy. You're going to be writing a lot of ads, you know, like uh, 100 ads, 200 ads, killing them off, adjusting them, tweaking them. You know, looking at a lot, you'll be increasing or decreasing the bid, you know, at least once a week as you, as you narrow down, increase your ROI. The difference is, is that if you're releasing one book a year, you can do that and make your profit because your ads are fun. As long as you're watching your ads closely, you're making sure you're getting a good ROI and return on them. And so one year, one book a year is not a problem because of the way your model's set up. And you just slowly build up your list of books that way. So they're two very different things and, and you know, two very different approaches to marketing your book and, and being able to sell your book. But the big difference is how fast can you write a book? Because if you can't produce fast enough, the email list will crush you. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to talk about... Um, what you're going to do with it, the, why the email list. Um, so we talked about how fast you write. So the email list, you're going to be able to pull beta readers from it. You're going to get reviews from it. You can get sales from it. Uh, we did talk about the cost, right? So depending on what, what email uh, service you're using, you can get 1000 to 2000 for free, just depending on who you use. Uh, for most writers, you know, if you're, if you're one, one book a year, that is not sustainable. Right. If that's the size of your email list, you know, I've got a thousand people. I write a book once a year, maybe 600 buy. You're not a full time author on that. Yeah. You know, so just something to look at there. Um, but one of the advantages of the email list is you get cross, cross email list promotions with other authors who have big lists. Now, if you're an ads author, that's not something you're going to appeal to authors with big lists about, you know. They're like, I've got 30,000 on my list. How you got? He's like, I got 120. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, I'm not sure we're going to trade lists. And so that's not an avenue you're going to be heavily pursuing if you're not writing a lot of books. But if you are, it's a great way to tap new audiences to get your name out there. You know, it's a very powerful tool that way. But again, you need to be an email list author, producing a lot of books, maintaining constant contact with your list. You know, mm. so so you'll hear people talk about that. But again, it is about a certain type of author who's using a certain marketing plan. So ads, um, the cost is up front. You know, like uh, you're going to be paying so much before you get the clicks. Uh, they do build slow, you know, and, and it takes it takes a couple months to figure out which ads are working, which ones aren't. Mm. You know, it's it's a slow building process. The, the upside is it's a solo, right? It works on one book. You know, it works if you're not a series writer, right? It still works. 
Uh, and the upside is it's, it's low budget. You can, you can do five dollars for a month if you want in ads. Mm. You know, or, you know, you can, you can set the caps anywhere, you know, to, you know, you can do a hundred dollars a day on an ad if you want. Just, you know, you can kind of set that up. So they're low budget and you can kind of manipulate it that way. Um, so building a list, uh, one of the, the two big ways, um, are giveaways. Um, sometimes that's a book giveaway. Uh, just this morning, I actually heard Nick Stevenson talking about his technique for building his list. He's an email list builder. Is he has a free book? He gives that book away, and then when you get to the end of that book, there's another giveaway at the end if you go to the website and get it through your email. Is it a sequel? I don't know if it's a sequel or a short story, um, but it is in another book, whether it's short or long. I I don't know for sure, but yeah. So that's how he's getting them. He has a free book. That people can find or there's promotion sites like Insta Freebie where you can then promote it and gather emails that way. And then at the end of the book, he says you can get even more free if you like this mm. just for your email for me to send it to you. And then that's how he's building his list. It's very effective. Um, you can do giveaways like uh, Kindles and whatnot. Um, now, I'm going to caveat this because... Doing a giveaway out, uh, uh, t- to be effective, you have to have a fairly decent social network already built. Hmm. And so building that social network is, you know, the technique I hear is the Twitter six. Every day you follow six people on Twitter. And the technique I find the most useful is I find authors similar to me. I click on who's following them and that's the people I follow. Hmm. Cool. And you're getting, um, you get effective subscribes that way, or yeah, yeah. I get I get a lot of people will retweet the the stuff I'm putting out about my book or about the authors we interview, and uh, it likes and stuff. And so it's mm. a, definitely a relevant audience who are interested in the kind of content I'm producing. Yeah. So, but yeah, and so I've I've built up to just under ten thousand that way. Um, just That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, just by doing my, my Twitter six each day. Actually, I, I, I probably end up doing 10 to 15 because when you, when you click on somebody else's list, it's so easy. Just click follow. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can, you can go through it fairly quickly and, uh, whatnot. So make sure you're releasing tweets as well. Uh, you can take quotes from your book, highlights from your book, reviews of your book. You can mine your reviews for the tweets to put them out there. So that's about, you know, building that social, Network because in order to promote a good a giveaway effectively, you need to have somewhere to promote it. Now, putting a book up on Amazon for free, you can get some traction that way, um, or you can even run ads on a free book to try and uh, you know build the audience that way to hook them into that email list. Um, the other one is Wattpad, which is a free writing platform where people write in serial. You'll put up a chapter at a time and whatnot, and uh, a lot of authors will put their free books there and then they link to Amazon if you want the next one in the series. Again, having a fairly strong social network is definitely going to help you do that. So, and if you're looking at yourself and saying, I don't have a social network, well, then take two hours a day instead of a Twitter six, build a social network. You know, spend a lot of time there. Go on to Facebook, join groups, comment, interact with people. Um, you know, and, and build your social network out that way. So, so like I said, we'll, we'll go into deeper on all of these. I just want to mention that I think, well, this is my approach even. Like I think about social networking or this is how I used to think of it. And I, I want subscribers, right? There's something I need. And so I go out there and I'm eager to take, right? I need something. But uh, I think it's really important to go out there with a, a giving mindset. How can mm. I, how can I make worthwhile contributions in these various communities? That's how you're going to build a real network, not yeah. by trying to grab. Yeah. Um, so developing ads, going the other route, more of the, the, the writers who take longer to write their books, whether it be they've got less time or they just take longer to write a book. I, I do a lot of research. I, I, I came to the conclusion very quickly, I'm not going to be the book a month guy. That's not me. <laughs> you know, I, I like my science. I like my history. Yeah. And it's got to be researched and double checked. And, and I like to, I like to revise and, and make sure I have a really polished, tight manuscript. Um, so in ads, uh, again, you're dealing with solo books versus series. And 
The big difference here is you you can look at that as uh, total profit because you know when you have someone buy into a series, you're going to have a percentage rating on how likely they are to finish this series, and that dramatically impacts the ROI, right? Hmm. So if it takes seven clicks at ten cents, it means it's seventy cents for them to buy the first book. Let's say the first book you're making a profit of three dollars, right? So you're profiting three dollars. Off of that, you lost seventy cents, so you're making two thirty. Well, you make three dollars on the next two books on thirty percent of those. Let's let's say fifty percent just to make the math easy, <laughs> right? I like that. <laughs> so so for fifty percent of those books, um, you're gonna make another three and six. So your total profit um, for each person buying in is uh, so it's two thirty. Plus the six puts us at eight thirty, and then that six is cut in half, right? Uh, for half of those people, so we take off two dollars there, and that <laughs> is your ROI, right, per click. So at seventy, so you're making six thirty at, <laughs> at seventy cents, right? That's your cost. Well, if you're making six dollars and thirty cents then you can up the cost of that ad because you're making so much on the back end. And this is where a lot of people struggle with Facebook ads and Twitter ads is that the cost of getting people to buy usually ends up being $1.30 or even $2 in clicks <laughs> before they get somebody to buy. Well, if you're only selling one book, it becomes really hard to make a positive ROI. Because your profit is maybe $2. Well, if it's costing you $2.50 to get anyone from Facebook to buy the book through all the clicks, then you're not making a profit. But if you're making $6.30 on average per person who buys the first book, then that's worth it for you to pay two thirty, right? It's great ROI. Yeah. And so where you're going to market uh, your ads is going to really depend on if it's a solo book or if it's a series, the total cost of the book. And um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, so I'll just. Oh, and if the full series is available yet. Right. Uh, yeah. If you're writing a series and be like, but it's a series. Be like, well, you won't know what your read through rate is until the series is done. Yeah. And and you're going to get a lot more fall off or fallout from those early readers. I would say fall off. Yeah. That like they're not going to. They're they won't come back up. because yeah. it was six months later you released the yeah. next one in the You'll series. Lose. Yeah, so that's where Amazon comes in, um, where people. That's where most writers get the lowest cost to purchase ratio, because people are there to buy books, right? They're on Facebook to chat with their friends, see what's going on. So people read the news there, and you're, then you're selling them a book. So they're not as interested in buying a book at that moment. So it's harder. It's a, it usually takes a lot more clicks to get a purchase off of Facebook, hmm. and you're competing with advertisers when you're when you're when you're selling a book on Amazon. You're competing with other books. When you're selling a book on Facebook, you're competing with people who are selling products that are worth over cost over thousands of dollars. So they don't care if they throw twenty dollars at an ad. They don't care. They're gonna make yeah, you know a thousand dollars in profit on the back end. So hmm. that's another thing that drives up the cost of your clicks. On Facebook, so again, yeah, that makes sense. Twitter and, and Facebook tend to be really hard marketing platforms unless you have a series and and good read through. Hmm. Um, but there's other de other other elements you can get from Facebook and Twitter uh, that you won't get from Amazon. Facebook will tell you the age group and the gender of the people who are clicking your ad, and that can impact how you write copy on Amazon. Hmm. Um, so, and then, uh, the third method is just leveraging your existing social media platform to sell books. This is a lot of work for very few sales unless you have a huge network. Um, but yeah, so this is posting your stuff on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, and just trying to draw interest that way. So if you have a really, you know, if you've got a million followers on Twitter who are active and, and really eager to follow your stuff, you can probably use that and sell a lot of books. But if you've got a thousand followers on Twitter, 500 friends on Facebook, you know, I don't know Instagram numbers very well. 
then it's not going to be a very effective tool to to go out and try and and sell in that arena. So you so social media posting, you've got to make sure you've got a large social media for it to be worth mm-hmm. your time. So even even for me at ten thousand followers on Twitter, it's not worth my time to really push my book a lot. I I mm-hmm. use I use a scheduling software, so like. A month ago, I scheduled tweets through December on the book. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it only took me like 10 minutes. I wrote up like three different ads. I scheduled them like twice a month through December. Hmm. What uh, tool did you use to schedule? Hootsuite. Cool. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there are tools that can make that easy. But again, I don't have a large enough uh, a social platform to really push my books effectively that way. So, actually, I don't. I almost want to sum up right now. Is this a good time to sum yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. That's that's everything. As as I mentioned, um, this is kind of the summary uh, of each direction. So you can kind of look at how fast do I write, which path am I going to follow based on that. Um. So yeah. So so it, as the months go on, we'll probably you know do a specific episode on each of these things. Look at how to start from the ground up, go from there. Um, but but we first just wanted you to have a direction, you know, because I've seen a lot of authors going one way or the other, and they you know they they get frustrated, and you know again it, it's a common thing where you just like this isn't working for me. I try something different. This isn't working for me. I try something different. So look at how fast you write a book, and then say. If I'm going to study marketing, I'm going to pursue it based on how fast I'm writing books. So, so this, like, we just covered a massive topic, just like from a very high level. Yeah. But I, I would just say to to you listeners, it can be overwhelming, right? Like you hear all these different things, uh, and I think being overwhelmed could make you not start not do anything (laughs) so so this is your homework you need to think about either doing setting up an email list so go to mailchimp.com and set up the little extension in there so that you can start collecting emails or you need to go to amazon marketing services i think it's ams.amazon.com and you need to go set up your first ad like yeah. All I'm saying is you should you should start on one of these two paths and you should just do something very basic. Yeah. So that all of a sudden you go, you know what? This is a huge topic, but I can do a little thing right now. Yeah. And I think if you if you get started down one of these paths, like it's going to grow. You're going to gain momentum as you go. Just yeah. Start small. Yeah. So and <laughs> and uh, my experience with ads is don't write one, write three. It takes like two minutes or less to write the copy. Copy, write, check it. Make sure your commas and your capitals and everything are good. <laughs> yeah. You know, like uh, there was a there was a girl in one of the groups I'm on, and she she had written up her copy and she was posting it on there. Be like, what do you guys think? This is going to be my Amazon ad. And the first thing I said is, don't write one, <laughs> write ten. You know, <laughs> be like, don't come here with a single ad and be like, is this working? Be like, write that ad, write ten more, and then and go put, test them and go test them and see which yeah. one works the best. And, uh, you know, she's like, Oh, duh. <laughs> like, don't, don't write one ad, the one single great ad. No, everybody's different. They've got different interests. And we'll even talk about that, looking at what, what keywords you're talking and writing copy to fit that keyword. So, but for, for now, if you, if you have a book out and you don't have any ads running and, and you're not writing books super fast, go out there and write some ads. You know, you can set, I think you can set like a dollar a day. You know, yeah, and, and, probably and won't you probably won't much. even spend that much. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be lucky to spend 10 cents your first day. Yeah, this is a side note. But for some reason, Amazon will not spend your money easily. No. Uh, although you do got to watch out because occasionally they will. You, you wanna... <laughs> anyway, we'll, so, we'll get more into it later. Yeah, we'll get more into it later. But yeah, so like I said, this was this was a summary and overview. What we wanted you to look at is the type of writer you are and then pick the path. So if you're going to buy a book on marketing... Make sure it's one at your kind of marketing that fits your writing style. So if you're, you know, writing one book every three years, you're not buying a book on email list building. It's not how you're going to make your money. You just don't write that fast. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, as always, we would love it if you would leave us a review. Um, we're changing the way we're going to do the giveaways. Um, I'm going to probably just give away an Amazon gift card. 
to a random person on the email list, and I will send you an email, oh. and uh, then you can, uh, yeah, contact us, and, and we'll get you the gift card. Um, so we're changing it. Uh, one, I think the gift card will be more appealing, but two, you, you've got to be on the list to, to win, and so, you know, that's just how we're going to do it from now on. So trying it different, we'll, we'll see how this goes for the next two months. Um, see if it, see if it does it, you know, if we get more people interested and, and joining for that. Um, because the audience is large enough. There's 15,000 of you. I don't know if you guys know that, but there's a lot of you. <laughs> no, that's sweet. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, you're, you're very, very, you're a very quiet group. We don't hear from a lot of you. Um, so, so we thought this would, would maybe motivate people. So it'll be $20 this first month. We'll, we'll see what happens and, uh, look at it next month, what we're going to do then. So if it works well, It'll go up. If it doesn't, stay the same and probably die out and we'll try something different. <laughs> <laughs> so just experimenting, seeing what's going to happen. Do you have anything else? I think that's it for me. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Right. Guys, yeah. thanks for listening. That's the end of our episode, so it's time to start writing. <laughs>